Okay. So Brooke has a couple different uh, images going on. Oh yeah. Okay. I've muted all the lines. Can everybody see the screen okay? So we're going to get started in the interest of time. So welcome to the Rotary Club of Carbondale. Uh, I should have played the bell sound, but I, but I missed it. So I'm going to play it now just so you can hear it. Now we have everybody's attention. Uh, thank you to Brad Austin for being our greeter today. Uh, I do have all the lines muted, so if you need to ask a question, please just unmute yourself. I'll try to catch you as uh, if I can see hands. Uh, Faith Miller, will you unmute yourself and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Faith. Cindy Bides, will you please lead us in a moment of reflection? Hi, Rotarians. This has been a week, another week, really, that has challenged all of us, I think, to examine our actions and beliefs with respect to how we treat others that are different from us. And there's been a lot of writings and uh, shared information about how you can educate yourself about the history of racism in our country and how to be better. And I would encourage all of you this week to reflect on your role and what you can do to educate yourself, um, whether that's reading a book or engaging with a conversation with someone that you haven't had before, or just examining you know, some of the things that have been posted. So my reflection is more of a challenge to do something to learn about the history of racism in our country and to be part of positive change. Thank you, Cindy. So I did for the this meeting, I did pick a different Rotary song. It is actually in our Rotary book. It's on page 88 of the Rotary book. It's Sing Out a Song of Rotary. I did find a club that actually had a recording of it online. So I'm going to play that for you. And of course, you're an enthusiastic pianist, Marie Butler. Motivation. I hope this is where I can find the room. This song is out a song of Rotary at page 88 of the Rotary Song. <laughs> <laughs> Sing out a song. 
So sing out a song of Rotary was our, our theme today. So Rick, do we have any guests with us today? I'm going to run through. I did not see any initially. Um, it does not appear we have any guests with us today. Just all okay, of our smiling you, faces Rick. of the Carbondale Noon Rotary. Thank you, Rick. Uh, couple of club announcements. Uh, the first one, uh, Rick and I talked late yesterday. We did find out that our project with Turley Park in coordination with the Kiwanis Club and the Southern Illinois Autism Center was approved. So the project is funded, even though I can't spell funds in the, in the PowerPoint. Uh, and the district did have extra money, so we did get an additional $200 toward our grant request. So, so the project, we should have the funds by check in July, and we'll be off and running with our district project. Rick, do you have anything you want to add to that? Other than I can't spell? <laughs> uh, one, <laughs> one thing to add, um, these, these funds do come through our Rotary Foundation um, gifts that we as a club provide. And we only get about 25% of that back into, into our area. So 50% of that goes to global grants uh, or global projects. 25% goes to district projects and district grants. And then 25% comes back to, um, to clubs through these grants. So uh, just a consideration and a solicitation, I guess, for everybody, if you're considering giving, um, that uh, that these funds do come through the district or through the Rotary Foundation gifts. Uh, thank you, Rick. The the next bit of good news is you will probably be receiving a, a survey from Sierra Allen later today or maybe tomorrow morning. Uh, as we try to develop a plan to go back to meeting face to face, we wanted to get a little bit of input from Rotarians as to. Should we continue the Zoom meeting? Should we continue to record it? So I think in the beginning, what we'll do is yes, we will record it. Yes, we'll continue Zoom. That way, if, if there are Rotarians that can't make a face-to-face -face meeting or are just not ready to, to come out, uh, you can still attend. Uh, but if you could fill out the survey, it will help us get a head count so we know how many people will be in the room. Uh, Mr. Booth asked us to fill out a, a written plan of how many people we think would be there what doors would we be using? Would we be cleaning on our way out? So I can draft a written plan and submit it to them. And that way we've got kind of a head count on food. And food service is another one of those is that will probably change. We'll, we probably won't be able to serve ourselves. We may have to have Janice, our server, actually serving all Rotarians as they go through the line. We may have to resort to a box lunch. So if you have any ideas, please, please submit them to us because it's uh, important that we hear everybody's concerns on it. Uh, thank you to Gayla. She's not on the call today. Uh, she is the participant and the winner of this month's challenge. Uh, is she on pace to pay $100, Jim Grant? It's, are we there? She's going to pay regardless, right, Jim? Thumbs up. She's paying anyway. So a couple projects I want to talk about, the, the Mass Carbondale and the, the Rotary themed Mass. Those projects have run their course. I'm out of inventory on the Mass project, and we are completely sold out of the, the blue and yellow Mass. So uh, congratulations. We're through with those two projects. Uh, one of the things that we've been talking about is how to help uh, Promise for Haiti for Mass. So if you still have old T-shirts, hold on to them. There will be a time where hopefully we can help them create their own masks. And the, the no sewing pattern that you see on the screen came from Rotarian Rick Morris. I will email it out later today if people are interested. Uh, so it's one of the ways that if, if you don't have the ability to sew uh, or you or better at just cutting fabric, maybe that, that methodology of creating masks will be better. Uh, a couple other announcements. Uh, the project for the SIH food is continuing. The Carbondale Warming Center, I did talk to Patty Stokes this morning. Today's menu includes pulled pork, smoked chicken, uh, baked beans, potato salad, and peaches. So they're, they're eating lunch right now. So thank you for your donations to the club. Thank you for continuing to pay those. Uh, and the, the money is going to a good cause. Uh, 
Uh, Gail, do you have anything to add on the Carbondale Warming Center project? Um, a thank you to Cindy Byes uh, for uh, contributions this past week. Also, Ed Reeder for contribution last week of more shelving. And then I had a note from Ed this morning that he has another donation of shelving. Uh, we'll get together later this afternoon. Um, I will check with Carmelita and send, Shane send to you a note uh, this afternoon or evening what they may be needing at this point if, if they need any more uh, donations. Great. Thank you, Gail. Uh, moving on to the 100 Little Things, these 10 projects there on the screen are, are complete. So, you know, just think about it. Since we launched this project in March, uh, for most of that time, we have been sheltering in place away from, from our community, but yet we still have completed 10 projects. So last week, we talked about finding sponsors for five projects. I went back through the board. There were a couple projects I didn't identify, and then a couple of Rotarians did contact me wanting to pick up one of the projects to be a sponsor for. Uh, so uh, the bottom two projects I want to focus on first, I know Carl Flowers is working on the census. So Carl, I listed you as, a, as the champion of that project. I know you're going to reach more than 100 people while you're doing that, so we might as well get some community service uh, recognition for that. Uh, since the last meeting, Rick Morris and I were contacted by an individual that is collecting masks to be sent to New Mexico to the First Nation Native Americans, Navajo, Apache, and Pueblo. They're all in need of masks in that, in that geographic area, and we're going to partner with uh, the Sunset Club to send some of those masks toward uh, New Mexico. Rick, do you, as the champion of that project, do you have anything you want to add? I do. Um, I got a message this morning from Mary Beth Aguilar. We're, we're partnering once again with the Murfreesboro Carbondale Mask Project. Those masks are ready to go. I'll be picking them up this afternoon and uh, shipping them directly off to the Navajo Nation. So I know the Sunset Club did at least 40 masks that they're sending. Um, and we are, we are sending those to the, I'm going to mispronounce this, the Jicaria Child and Family Education Center that serves 150 youth uh, from ages one month to five years of age. Um, if you haven't heard, the, the Native American nations out in New Mexico and Arizona have been particularly hit hard by this pandemic because they don't have running water. They don't have the ability to wash their hands every, you know, for 20 seconds a couple times a day. Um, and they may not have all the same supplies and PPE that we do. Um, they also don't have the hospital systems that we do in, in areas like this. So many of these people are living without electricity, without running water in their homes. Um, so we, we are sending 100 masks, both child size and um, some adult size, some extra large ones. Um, so those will be picked up this afternoon, and the funds for that are coming from the leftovers from the uh, SOC project. Myself and a couple other people put some money together. So we're going to be paying for shipping with, the, with that cash and donating the remainder back to the, um, back to the mask making group so they can continue, continue their work. Uh, message from Mary Beth this morning. Uh, that group started as a way to get masks and PPE to first responders, healthcare workers, hospital, ambulance, nursing homes, um, women's center, warming center, SIH facilities. Uh, we've kind of reached a capacity with that, and they're now reaching out and branching out to other countries, states, and organizations because there's not as much of a high demand here. To date, the Carbondale Murfreesboro Fabric Mask Response Team have made and delivered over 7,000 masks handmade masks and surgical face masks to the community and to, um, you know, now to, they, they, we partnered with them for our Haiti masks that we sent initially. Um, and now we're doing with the Navajo Nation as well. And, and the people that are involved in that project are really happy to help us out with, uh, with, this, with this task. Uh, so, you know, we're gonna, be, we're gonna be sending those out to the Navajo Nation later today. Thank you, Rick. Does anybody else that's a champion on any of these projects want to talk about it before we move on? Faith? Hi, everybody. Just real quick. Um, as far as the military cards, 
we could probably count that one is done tentatively. I met with uh, Ed Smith, who is the coordinator of the volunteers for the Veterans Honor Flight this month, when did I meet him? Monday, and um, passed off some cards to him. When I, when I saw this project, immediately thought of Veterans Honor Flight, and he jumped on it. He already has the cards, he already has identified about 24 folks that will be helping him out. So he has those. I kept 10 cards. So it looks like about the, the of, of, of everybody that's working on it, we'll probably have like 10 cards a piece. And because there are not gonna be any flights until next year, we thought let's try to give some of them to the veterans at the VA hospital where he goes quite a bit and also to honor the vets on their particular military branch of service, uh, birthdays or anniversaries, like the Army just celebrated one. So uh, whichever one is coming up. And then even if it goes until November to Veterans Day, I think we can count that project as completed. Okay, thank you, Faith. Anybody else? Seeing none, we're going to move on. Uh, I'm going to skip over that in the interest of time. We'll do that next week. Uh, district news, the, the district is happen, having a happy hour on Thursday night at 630. I'll send out notice of that. So if you're wanting to connect with a few other Rotarians in the district, uh, you can find out whether they're drinking water or gin and maybe have a little get together for an hour. Uh, the district changeover is actually June 27th. Uh, I did write a letter. I wrote a news piece for the district uh, newsletter, and I've been asked to present that at the district changeover. So I'll, I'll include that in the email that will go out later today as to what that news release looks like. And it basically discusses our 100 Little Things project. So I think it's good that the district recognized what we're doing and is showing some interest, and it's going to get the word out around the district. So, And on Youth Exchange, I did get a a call the other day that they are trying to work with Rotary International to see if anything can be done because there are some uh, students that would like to go outbound even though Rotary International and the district are saying no there are still students that would like to go is there any way that they can make that happen so they're, they're considering that there's nothing firm on on any inbound or outbound right now it's still canceled but uh, at least the district is considering it uh, Rotary International, the, the virtual conference starts Saturday. If you're not registered, there's still time. Uh, Rotaryconvention.org is the website. And if you have any questions on it, just let me know. Uh, before we get to good news, we've got a little bit of bad, sad news to share. Uh, our friend Julian Harrison passed away this past week. Uh, I did talk to Jim Chapman today. He's, he's doing about as well as can be expected. But it, I am sending a card on behalf of the Rotary Club to him, but his address is on the screen if you'd like to send a card directly from, from yourself to him. So, yes. Does anybody have any good news to share for the, the sake of the club? Christine. Yes, um, this past Sunday, we celebrated uh, 45 years of uh, mostly marital bliss. Mostly. And also, I'd like to tell everybody that um, Judy Travelstead let me know that, that Will was totally surprised by the party and just thrilled to pieces. So that's my good news. Great. Thank you, Christine. Anybody else have anything? My son turned a year old on Sunday. <laughs> He's almost walking. Fun times. Well, one thing I've got to share is uh, the photos from Will's party. Uh, I Thank you to Faith. Thank you. There's a couple others that sent me some photos. I think everybody that was there is going to appear in one of the photos in the next couple of slides. Uh, thank you to Gail and Alan for, for, the, for the music. It was, I'm sure Will loved that. 
so I think everybody should, that was there is in a photo somewhere. Uh, everybody had on masks, which was great. We, we kept our distance. Photo on the bottom right is Sharon Harris Johnson sticking her nose in the bags looking for some sort of snack. Uh, Gail, as Acting Sergeant at Arms, do you have anything to say today before we move on to our guest speaker? Oh, well, if it was within my capability, I would probably find the group that provided the music today. I, I think they may have uh, had a three martini lunch before they did that. I, I don't know if that was a good example of resetting, but uh, I think our sing-alongs go much better, and I'm happy to head up a, a recording session so we can uh, post some things on, online. Uh, I, I would not issue a fine against Will, uh, given the uh, advanced age and, and also given the fact that I'm not that many years behind him and mine's coming up next Wednesday and I would hope that that's a precedent that I won't be fine uh, myself. So uh, everybody else in the club is uh, doing double duty on good deeds so nobody in our group gets a fine today. Uh, thank you to Jim Grant and uh, for organizing the drive-by for Will and Al Bennett for organizing the music sing-along and for everybody who came out. It was a good showing, so thank you, everybody. Shane? Yes, uh, sir. Just so everybody knows, Will went ahead and his tradition is to contribute a dollar a year for his birthday. And so he contributed, gave me $90 for his birthday and $10 in hopes of seeing 100. So, so we met our $100 goal with Will. So whoever's matching, it's already done. Oh, darn. Yep, that'd guess, be Galen. Oh, darn. I guess that sets a precedent that I have to follow, huh? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if I make it to next week, I'll fulfill that. Okay. <laughs> That's all from me. Thank, thank you, Gail. Well, our guest speaker is Brooke Guthman. Uh, I am going to unshare my screen. And Brooke should be sharing her screen in just a second. It says it's disabled. Hmm. Brooke, you're showing that you have two two uh, uh, devices operating, yes. and one of them does not have its video on. Oh. One of them is. Okay, is Brooke. I'll that's fine. I'll go ahead and take over, Brooke. That way you can just talk. How's that? Okay. That'll be fine. Can you see the screen okay now? I can. Okay. Well, um, if you don't know me already, my name is Brooke Guthman. I work for Shane at Egyptian Electric Cooperative as the member services manager. And today I'm going to pretty much tell you about two um, different stories. One is uh, my professional um, path and one is my uh, personal on kind of what I like to call my hometown comeback or revitalize 62966s as I like to call it. So I'll start by saying that I'm married um, to my husband, Ryan, um, who does a lot of work for me on the side. Uh, as you'll see, I have three children. I'm a 1999 Murfreesboro High School graduate. I've lived here all my life. Um, I'm a 2003 SIU grad as well, and I'm just a lover of anything hometown. So I'd like to start today, I guess, by kind of um, where did I get today? And this was a good exercise for me to kind of journal every, everything that I've been through and, and how I got to where I'm at. So in, I started as a staking engineer in 2005, and in 2015, um, I became the member services manager. And although that covers communications, um, front office, uh, publications, social media, key accounts, things like that, it also includes economic development. So as a seat on the table, um, I joined uh, Jackson Growth Alliance in October of 2017, 
and it is the county economic development uh, representation and it was funded and created by the city of Murfreesboro, city of Carbondale, SIU, Jackson County, and the SI airport. Um, and right after I joined that board, this is kind of where the personal track starts, but I was approached to um, purchase three of nine buildings that my friend Jamie Green was trying to get ownership with or from downtown. And um, so I was considering this, um, but I really didn't have um, any goals or thoughts about it. I just was thinking about it. So in May of 2018, I attended a yearly national cooperative event in Salt Lake City. And I had heard um, two keynote speakers from two different groups. One was with Laura, uh, Laurel Mercantile, and they had created a group called Downtown Comeback. And as well as um, Zachary Mannheimer from McClure Engineering, uh, based out of Des Moines, Iowa. And they pretty much um, had the same message, and it was about rural America revitalization. And their, their philosophy was kind of based on these um, topics here, about how urban migration is happening, that the, the larger cities are becoming saturated, and people are starting to move out of those, as well as with increased technology, that the need to live in a large city just isn't as important as it once was. That the millennial generation is wanting to, re to reinvent themselves um, in small towns and, you know, through entrepreneurial um, avenues. Uh, also about the importance of creating quality of life amenities to attract people and businesses. So the thought on that is you're competing with every other town across the United States to get a large company to move to your town. But if you create the amenities and create the town and the culture and the atmosphere that people want to live in, that those things will follow. And it's more of a small business minded philosophy rather than big business. Also the importance of marketing and branding your community based on what's unique. All communities across the United States have something unique about them and what is that and play on it. Um, also to focus on cultural um, amenities as well. And that is through um, maybe like for entrepreneurial like coding academies, things like that, or on the cultural side like live theater, music, public art, um and then it's repurposing and remodeling historic buildings downtown um, to kind of rejuvenate from what was and recreate it to um, today's themes uh, the public art and that is just kind of plays back onto that what makes your community unique um, people like to be in an area that um, that has that cultural experience and then the last thing and the most important thing is just taking pride in your community um, this was from October of 2018. Uh, we, after taking, actually, I'm going to go back. After, um, after hearing them speak in, in August or in May, I was just completely, um, changed. I was like, I have to purchase these buildings. I have to be a, a change maker in my town. And this is an opportunity. And I actually went and talked to them after the, the conference about this and it just solidified what my passions were. Um, so um, in August of 2018, I did purchase those buildings, um, actually before my friend Jamie. So my husband and I purchased three buildings and it was really just to start taking a hold of downtown and demonstrating, um, well, and demanding change for that matter. So I took um, those ideas that I had learned in May at that conference and brought them to my Jackson Growth Alliance board. And since Carbondale, um, they already have like their own economic development um, department and they're kind of doing their own thing. We were thinking, well, let's do something in Murfreesboro. And I just kind of gave the ideas and everybody else went with it. So we brought him to our town in October and we really pushed it hard on inviting these community leaders to come. We had the, the lunch sponsored, we had the space sponsored, and we had over 50 community leaders show up to hear um, all these philosophies and about how we can be part of a change. So in February of 2019, myself and some others from Jackson Growth Alliance um, began fundraising to raise nearly $70,000 to bring him to Murfreesboro. And in April, we had probably about 60% of the funding and we began, we began the work. Um, in June of 2019, 100% of the project was funded. And as you can tell, the project investors um, who we have there, 
those are all the different buy-ins um, that we had. So it gave me one, it gave us an avenue to raise some money. And then it also gave us an opportunity to go and speak with all of these, like for the, the school board. Um, we went to the, I went to a Murfreesboro Main Street meeting. I went to a city council meeting, um, the tourism commission meeting, um, applied for a Smizer Foundation dollars. So it gave me an opportunity to talk about it. So then that showed their commitment to these efforts as well. Um, the steering committee members, that's the first thing that they wanted to do, was create a committee of, uh, to, to basically express collaboration amongst the different entities, as well as a diverse group of people when we decide on our future of, you know, like the future vision of the city. So as you can see, these are all the different people that were included in the steering committee. And they also created, um, we also had individual community visioning sessions aside from the steering committee. But basically, the thought is, when we talk about the future vision, this is Murfreesboro in 1942. And actually some of my buildings are in this picture. I was forwarded this picture from um, Mike Jones with the uh, Historic Preservation Com Commission, but this is what it was. And then the picture on the right is really what we want to see in our town. But the next slide shows what we actually see. And um, this was the purchase day. These are some photos um, from when I purchased the buildings, my husband and I in August of 2018. Um, these are the three. Um, the one on the right is 1318 Walnut, and I'm gonna talk about that one later. So kind of vi remember that, that visual picture. And then the picture on the far left is the inside of it. And this is after about 80% of the stuff inside was removed. Um, it was being used as a rental space to, to store stuff. And it was covered with quilts in the window. And then the other two buildings um, had businesses on the, the main floor. And then they had two apartments upstairs. So this lady had actually purchased them about uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and really hadn't done anything with them. So this is kind of the problems that we see in the buildings downtown. Uh, we interact, or we had collapsed sewer lines, leaky roofs, um, ugly awnings. Um, nothing was to code. Nothing had been updated since the 70s. Um, one of my buildings had termite damage. And as I said, they were being used as storage. So basically when McClure came in, the first thing was, is what like who we are and what makes us unique so these are a few things about murfreesboro that i kind of pulled up one is you know we're the red devils the barbecue capital of illinois home of general john a logan home of the big muddy monster um, the murfreesboro apple festival and kind of the the western entrance to the shawnee national forest kincaid lake lake murfreesboro um, so those are things that we talked about first um, the next thing we talked about was weaknesses and strengths. Shane, would you, okay, you got that. And um, some of the things that were identified as weaknesses was departing population, crime, not the hustle and bustle downtown that there once was. We had a, like Carbondale, I'm sure, and other small communities, we had bad rap on uh, the public school system. You know, deteriorating buildings, um, a disconnect, this is something that was, I felt really strongly about, is we have all these great organizations in our communities, but there's just a disconnect because everybody's doing their own thing, but there's not a lot of communication or support for everybody's efforts. And I mean that regionally too within the county, whether it be Carbondale, Murfreesboro, uh, Murfreesboro, Marion, um, Carbondale, Marion, they're just, there's just not a lot of collaboration. Um, we have a lack of gathering places and, and that's just really a place where people get together and have conversation whether it be a coffee shop or an outdoor park uh, just those kind of spaces fresh food uh, options live theater and cultural experiences things for kids and teenagers to do that was a big one lack of shopping uh, driving distances for services and what I mean by that is we have a huge export of dollars that go to let's say baseball hitting practice and uh, volleyball. I drive my daughter to DeCoin to do volleyball. Um, or maybe we just don't have those services at all. It's like, so that's kind of what I mean by that. Uh, lack of downtown charm. Um, 
And another big one, which I'll touch on in the next slide, not now, but is that many people work here, but they don't live here. And that's not just for Murfreesboro, but for the county. Some of the, the strengths that we identified was a great volunteer base, great people, motivated young mayor. Um, we had a Main Street uh, organization that resurfaced. We have the ability to support two private schools. Um, we have high traffic volume on Walnut Street. We have some um, businesses that have kind of, you know, um, identified our community, such as 17th Street Barbecue and Rural Pie. Um, we have wonderful festivals, such as the Apple Festival, Cruise Nights, Sunset Concerts, Hometown Christmas, the, the, the Brew Fest in October. Um, also, we are located near SIU and Carbondale, and we have a diverse um, population in this county. We have great, his, like a, a very defined and historic, like identified downtown. Like it's, it's a narrow path, you know, you know what it is. It's not scattered all over town. Uh, we have rural hospitals, we have natural resources, and we're home to many local contractors and talented artists. This next slide, what I really want to just show is this it relates to not just Murfreesboro, but Jackson County. Um, this is part of the, the statistics that McClure provided us with, but 84% um, of the people that work in Murfreesboro don't live in Murfreesboro. Nearly 60% of the people that work in Jackson County don't live in Jackson County. So it's kind of addressing, like this project is not just for uh, Murfreesboro, but you know, how can we create the space that people are looking for to live? So McClure's deliverable, we were just actually delivered the project um, earlier this month, and it's called uh, Revitalization 62966. So it's an action plan. It's not a strategic plan. It actually breaks it into seven categories. So housing, downtown revitalization, business assistance, shared streets, community calendar, public art, and it also has next steps on like a daycare, um, some green space and maker space um, ideas. So the first one is the housing. And basically, um, it's a very elaborate plan. It's fantastic. Um, but it's about creating a, a revolving loan fund to really start rehabbing these houses and um, to, to bridge the gap because we have a lot of lower income homes or smaller homes that are rentals, um, two bedroom, one bath possibility. Well, and then we have the, the extreme of really nice homes that are really expensive. So it's like you, we're missing that that gap in between for to attract new families, um, maybe you know updated options for people to choose from. They actually identified that as our number one problem. And then so we also as a place to start, the Historic Preservation Commission had already identified a spot for the Longfellow Bungalow District. So that's what's highlighted in red. They already wanted to do that. The downtown revitalization and business assistance um, Basically, they created us another website. It's called Move It to Main Street. And it's an online directory um, that we are working to compile of vacant or available properties, uh, description on code requirements, as well as details and how to's on how to apply for incentives. And then we have a collaboration business plan between Rule of Pie, and they actually own this building next to them, and creating a sandwich shop to share resources, such as sharing employees, sharing spaces, sharing uh, bathrooms and kitchens to make it more cost effective. Um, the shared streets. So the, the plan for this is to create a better streetscape experience and a better utilization of spaces for drivers, business owners, visitors, and residents. So this is an idea, a concept that they gave us for alleyway. It's a place to display public art, um, utilize it for pedestrian um, traffic, you know, outdoor seating. And we actually have an alley identified to not do this, but do the concept. Um, and then this is also something that they had um, shown us. It's called like a bump out and it's a unique, a unique take on uh, shared streets. So it's just to improve space and uh, traffic safety. Whenever there's bump outs, it reduces speed as well as just the quality of life aspect. The community calendar, um, this kind of goes back to that collaboration and working together to really communicate um, what everyone's trying to do so we can all support it. So this was a part of that. 
uh, public art. Uh, this is the first project that we are actually going to start working on. We were notified by the artist community. There's about 50 artists in our community. Um, and we, we need to take advantage of that. So uh, this mural right here that's actually being done in Perryville right now um, is done by a Murfreesboro artist. Her name is Christine DeShazzo. Um, she's also a wall dog, which is an artist organization, international art, artist organization. So we would like to tap into that resource to start the same movement. Um, the public art also includes wayfinding. It's just to be more accessible to visitors. That everybody knows where everything's at and, you know, create, create art around that. Uh, maybe some art pieces. And then we also have identified as a next steps is this art park. And I have a, a lot on Walnut Street that I want to do this um, for, but this is done in Laurel, Mississippi. On our way back from a family vacation, we stopped in that same town of some of those um, presenters I was telling you about. And this is an art park that they created. It's AstroTurf, and it's just a, a community-centric uh, uh, location to where they've, if they just, it's beautifying the space. Then I'm gonna to jump to um, kind of my project, back to my husband and I, what we have done. So the way we looked at it is like, well, how can I ask people to invest in this community if we're not willing to do it ourselves? So our very first project was taking a two bedroom, one bathroom um, apartment above one of our storefronts and creating it into an Airbnb. So we did a total gut job on it. Uh, trim doors, we had to put in central air, new flooring, um, exterior doors, appliances, and then we've we dubbed it the Pink Lady on Walnut, um, inspired by apples. So that is was our first project. Our second project, um, we my friend Jamie and I, we kind of call ourselves the the city economic development recruiters, and we're asking people to not just come into our spaces because that to us doesn't really matter at all. It's just about getting them in some spaces. And um, TJ Cowan of Carterville, um, he worked with my friend and he had said he was interested in, in opening one. So we met with him uptown and by the, in our hour conversation, I showed him this building and he was like, I want this space. Um, so it was a risk on both of our parts. Um, you know, it was a risk on my husband and I, we, we invested a lot of money to, to redo the storefront, but it was an investment on him to take a chance on Murfreesboro. So his storefront will actually open, next slide, um, in about two weeks. Okay. And it's going to be called the Cold-Blooded Coffee and Roastery. He actually has some coffee that he's selling out of a store in Marion, and he has um, a couple franchises in Nashville, Tennessee. So he specializes in cold brew. But anyway, this is the inside of the building now. Um, we started it in the fall of last year, and again, it was a complete gut job. Uh, we used, we we're proud to say we used all Murfreesboro contractors except for the drive it on the front. Um, it was one that we had quite a bit of termites and termite damage in. Uh, the roof was absolutely not non-functioning. I'm surprised that we were able to restore the original tin ceiling in it. Um, we also it took down some plaster and exposed um, the brick on the one side. New, new flooring, we had to add two ADA accessible bathrooms as well as, you know, set it up for a restaurant set up in the back. So um, yeah, it did not have power for I don't know how many years, no ventilation, it was a disaster. So this was our second project. Um, when going through this, I'm really big on just, you know, always remembering the things to celebrate. So these are just a few of the items that I like to keep tabs on because it keeps you motivated, that people do believe in the, the idea and there are things happening. And we have to remember that um, going forward. And then also um, is we just have to talk about it. Like that's my biggest thing is any opportunity I get is just, just talk about it. Um, and the Jackson CEO group is one that I had talked with. I brought them uptown to my store, one of my storefronts um, around Apple Festival. And Aurora, it was actually a member of our steering committee. 
And as you can tell, um, when I had first met her, she had, she was wanting to get out of this town and not come back. And, um, whenever I got an email from her a few weeks ago, she was saying that she has now reconsidered and she has a different, uh, you know, a view on our hometown and she wants to stay or return to Southern Illinois. This one I was super excited about. I had approached our statewide association about doing a downtown revitalization um, piece and they said that they would do it. So we started back at the end of last year and it was published in March of this year. And it was a couple page spread, um, a feature article on Welcome Back Murfreesboro. So us four in the picture are the ones who um, contributed to it. You can read the article at that website. Um, and the magazine went to 190,000 mailboxes across the state. So that was nice to talk about it because I feel like the more you talk about it, the more uh, people believe it's going to happen. Um, this just came out a few weeks ago. I did not know at the time, but I hosted this lady in my Airbnb, as you can see in the middle, uh, around uh, Valentine's Day. And she's the editor in chief at an Edible Memphis uh, magazine. And she was coming, this was her second time back to Murfreesboro. And really what I want to take away from it is this kind of publicity. And um, this is the kind of stuff that we have to keep selling. So it says, so take it from me. If you decide to spend a night or two in Southern Illinois, Murfreesboro is the place to be. And it's a nice drive, a lovely change of scenery, and an absolute must for beer lovers, which she's talking about Scratch Brewery, just outside of Murfreesboro. So really my whole uh, talk today, I guess, is just kind of about what I've learned and my journey. And this is just my take on what I've observed of what is needed for success when doing this. And the first thing is just taking pride in your community, like be present, participate. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, be interactive in the community. Like, and for instance, my husband and I, this is just two things that, that we've decided upon as a married couple, is our kids are not going to do um, a travel sports, league. Both my boys love sports um, and are good at it, but we are committed to stick with our rec programs um, as well as we had a conversation the other day about SIU. I'm like, how can I tell people, even in my job, to support SIU, go to SIU if I'm not willing to, to have that commitment myself. So we've decided that's our plan. Um, and then also, so just no more negative talking about our towns or Southern Illinois in general. Like absolutely under no circumstances, it just has to stop. And we have to interject in those conversations and stop it because it's not true. Uh, I think what's happened is just the negative talk has gotten out of control. People start to believe that this is a terrible place to live. And it's really not, we all know it's not. Um, lead by example, do what you say you're gonna do. Don't ask somebody to do something that you're not willing to do yourself. And I mean that by acting and by investing. Always be networking and to sell your story and look for opportunities. So I don't know how many times I've had conversations with people and different opportunities have arose, whether it be a funding opportunity or somebody to step in and help with implementing some of these um, projects. Funding. McClure says that money is never the, the issue, that there's always, there's money out there. It's just a matter of getting it. So that, don't let that be a deterrence. And then also, be non-competitive and non-territorial. I think that is where we absolutely go wrong, is you have to be willing to, uh, to be open-minded to everything. Like I was, I was selling a friend of mine, well, Amy Mills, I was telling her, I was like, hey, there's this great coffee guy that you need to bring in your shop whenever you open it. And even though I have a coffee shop and it can affect my business, that is not, it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? We're all working together. And um, that's what's most important. So be open-minded, always be willing to pivot because things change. Um, and actually sometimes it feels like you're taking two steps back, but that's after you've taken four steps forward. Um, be inclusive, step outside your comfort zone. Um, we need leaders um, and doers, but not talkers because doers are the, like you just have to continue to make progress. Um, don't feel guilty about asking for money or volunteers to get the job done. Stay positive, stay focused, 
be patient, but don't wait on somebody to do the work because that's where I have recognized. I feel like all these years I have been waiting for somebody else to make these changes and it hasn't happened and it's not going to happen uh, if we wait on other people. So we have to sometimes take the initiative to, to start seeing progress. Um, having an action plan. That's why we decided to have a third party come in and do an action plan for us. Many times cities, um, you know, do a strategic plan and all it does is sit on the shelf because there's no action items, you know, associated with it. And um, sometimes they just do that so they can apply for grants, but really it's just a waste of resources because there's no real way to get there. So I also say, believe it will happen because passion and passion is contagious um, and expect that people are gonna think you're crazy. My parents said we were crazy when we bought these buildings and now they're kind of like, oh, wow. And so sometimes it just takes people to really start showing progress for people to, to you know, end up buying in. So I feel like that's what has created our community buy-in and you know, now progress. So this is from our creative placemaker, um, Zach. He um, did a lot of work in our town. And basically what I wanna just say is, this was very important to me that he said this because he says that he works in a lot of places and he doesn't see what he sees anywhere else like he does in Murfreesboro. So that was inspiring for me. So what are our next steps? I'm just gonna pretty much break it into three. We're splitting into task forces now and we have bi-monthly meetings to keep each other accountable and actually start working towards them. Um, we're starting with the public art plan, the shared streets. Um, I'm more involved in the shared streets project. You know, we're getting a resurfacing project right now. And this fall, we'll be applying for some ITEP funding to do some streetscape beautification. And then the third step right now is raising money and just really create a message and brand what we're doing and promote it. My next steps, <laughs> we're getting ready to remodel the middle building that we have. Um, we have a young resident who um, is ready to open up. She wants to do a very hip hair salon and we're going with it. So um, we're considering um, if we're going to remodel the apartment above it or if we are going to make that an additional space for the storefront or if we are going to make that another Airbnb. And then the coffee shop has always been in my dream. I wanted to have a coffee shop, but his plan is much better than mine. And um, so my next dream is to have a bookstore. So I don't know, we'll see. And then, so these are just some last minute questions that I just wanted to leave with everybody about, you know, what are the positive attributes in your community? What makes your community unique? Its biggest challenges, what's it lacking? And what are you passionate about? And how can you make a difference in your community? Because we all have different passions and nobody's passion is probably going to be exactly like mine but it's a combination of all of them that is what's needed to to make the changes and that's all i have thank you brooke does anybody have any questions for brooke i do um Brooke, I, when I've been in Murfreesboro recently, I noticed they're tearing down the, I think it's the old Gillenberg buildings across from the courthouse. It looks really terrible, of course, right now, but um, any thoughts on, on the use of that space when it's gone? Well, I have heard, I mean, you just hear a bunch of gossip, but the, the building still needs to come down. And I think it's a discrepancy between the county. I think it adjoins some county buildings, uh, but I think that might be what the holdup is, is just working together on that. Um, I had heard, I don't know if it's true or not, that the county was wanting to make that a parking lot. I know I had approached him before it had fought, caved in about selling it and he wanted like $400,000 for it. Yeah. But I, I think he was holding out for the county to purchase it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I think a lot of people's eyes are on that, but I don't know what will happen. I don't, I don't think anything can happen. I have a friend on the county board and she's hoping, and Sharon Harris Johnson, you might know something about this. She's um, hoping that they can have like an, um, an annex, you know, combine a lot of, of the county offices that are apparently now scattered around Murfreesboro and mm -hmm. put them in a new building there. But 
I don't know if that's really being discussed. Well, when I was on the county board, we um, discussed a lot of things going on there. It's just the money. <laughs> you know, our property values as former treasurer, of course, have gone down so much. And it's just the money issue. Um, I know now with the COVID responses, there'll be smaller amounts of money coming back to the counties. Um, but there, there's a desire. And I think every single one of the 14 county board members want something there. Uh, Maureen Berkowitz, our uh, supervisor of assessments, her office wall um, is the same wall that's connected to Gillenberg's on the other side, the actual part where the roof fell in. So um, she, uh, the county is renting space for her right now. Now for the first year, our liability insurance paid for it. But I just commented the other day when I drove through downtown, I'm not for sure if that's still the situation. So yeah, I think everybody wants it to work. It's just, um, we don't know the stability of our, uh, our what the county owns there. Uh, or, um, uh, we have about three buildings there. And actually it's the um, uh, board re uh, a review uh, uh, office that shares that um, wall. So it's, it's, but you know, they're moving along and they're making a little bit of progress. And I think with insurance and everything, we'll just have to wait and see, like Brooke, you hear everything, but you don't know. Yeah. Much. Yeah, and, and actually that's kind of the philosophy of what we're doing with the housing and with the business creation is the more tax dollars that are funneled into our community and county, you know, that will lessen the burden, but we have to, we have to fill these buildings and we have to fill up these houses in order to have that tax base. Brooke, yes. what's going on with the, um, with the old train station that seems to have been under remodel for as long as we've lived here? Oh, my I know God. the guy appears in the news every once in a while. He says he's going to do something, but it never seems to progress. And it's a, such a great building. Yeah, we we tried to include him in this process, and, and uh, we didn't really get anywhere. So I don't know what – it's an unfortunate situation. But, again, you know, we can focus on the bad stuff, or we just have to keep – it's one of those things that if we keep making progress, then hopefully it will push those other situations to change. Well, maybe it will inspire him to get going. Yeah, or, you know, maybe it'll inspire somebody else to want to buy it or take it over. I will say that. It's a wonderful um, building. I, I think that Jamie and Shannon Green own, and Brooke, um, you could correct me. Um, I'm working out there with a young man now. Um, and it is, I mean, I was, you know, in that store, that space before, and it's just beautiful. They do a beautiful job. They they do the front for him and he's 26 years old. So, but he, uh, it's just a beautiful building and it's so good to go downtown and not have to drive to Carbondale or even, you know, farther uh, mm -hmm. to work out. Yeah. And Jamie, that's who my friend is. Uh, we were friends before all this, but now we're business owners together and we share ideas. And then we're also involved. Um, we're both part of the Delta Leadership Institute this year. And we both work together on, on these business recruitments. Any more follow-up questions for Brooke today? Thank you, Brooke, for a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, to, to wrap up today, next week is changeover. Uh, the meeting's going to be at noon instead of at 5 o'clock, unfortunately. Uh, I think the, the noon meeting format is preferred. I did get a couple messages that more people wanted to see it at noon, so we're going to leave it at noon. Uh, so next week, be ready for the, the changeover. Uh, and I will ask uh, Gail White to lead us in the Shane, following test. Shane, before yes. the last thing, um, what about adopt a spot? Oh, yeah, I forgot completely about that. I skipped over that. Yes, we are going to do adopt a spot cleanup Saturday, 9 a.m. We're going to meet at the entrance to the super park. If you're unfamiliar with where we've been meeting, email me and I will send you a map to where we will be at probably a little bit before 9 a.m.
So if you need more information, uh, email me and I'll make sure you get it. And thank you, Pam, for reminding me of that. I did skip right over the top of that. Gail, floor is yours. All right. Please join me in the four-way test of the things we think, say, and do. First, is it the truth? The truth. Second, is it, is it fair, fair to all concerned? concerned? Third, will, it, will build it build goodwill? Better friendship. Better friendship. And fourth, better friendships. Be beneficial to all concerned. Thank you, everybody. Have a great week. We'll see you soon. Okay.